What's up guys, welcome back to Deck Tech for Dex. Today we're building Winter, the emo space warlock that's going to get you banned from your playgroup. Now this guy's pretty simple, he's going to have Ward 2, and he's going to draw everybody two cards at the beginning of your upkeep. Group hug, right? Well, not exactly, because he also has a Delirium ability. As long as there's four or more card types in your graveyard, he's going to reduce everybody's hand size by the amount of card types in your graveyard. And you might be asking yourself, is there more than seven card types in Magic? Yeah, there's, there's way over seven. So we're going to get as many of those card types in our graveyard as soon as possible, reduce our opponent's hand size to zero, and then we're going to be playing some discard cards. That way, whenever we do give them two cards on our turn, we're going to make them discard it before they untap on theirs, making it to where everybody has to top deck. They're going to basically watch you play magic and you're going to strip away their hand. Not exactly a fun, you know, play style, but this deck's supposed to be gross. This isn't supposed to be your group hug fun deck. No, this is Jund group hug and this is exactly what I'd expect Jund group hug to be. You're just going to sit down, act like you're going to give your opponents cards, but instead you're just going to make their life miserable. Now the other thing we're going to have in this deck is ways to gain life. So we're also going to pair this with a life gain strategy and that's going to fit in perfectly with the other strategy of the deck, wheels. The more we can wheel, the more cards we can get in our graveyard, and there's a lot of life gain synergies with wheels, and we're going to need the life gain strategy in this deck as well, because we're 100% going to be targeted by our opponents, and you know, you can't really blame him for it. This guy's just gross. He's disgusting, and he's going to draw a lot of hate. This is basically going to be your Jund Turgrid. If you're playing this guy, expect to get hated off the table. So we're actually going to, uh, you know, plan for that. We're going to include some goat effects, some life gain effects, and we're going to try to stick in this game as long as possible. That way, we can strip away our opponent's hands. From there, we do have a couple breach lines that cause us to win the game out of nowhere. We're playing your Bone Miser effects. We're playing your Waste Knot effects to generate mana whenever our opponents are discarding stuff and whenever we're discarding stuff. Notably, Bone Miser is better here because 9 times out of 10, whenever we wheel, our opponents aren't going to be discarding anything because they don't have a hand. So Bone Miser, very important to this strategy. Another thing we're really going to lean into in this deck is using some niche cards that have dual typings that throw themselves into the graveyard. This is going to ensure that we hit Delirium very early and start chipping away at our opponent's hand size. Another thing I'm super excited to try out in this deck is using Disa as a secondary win con. If the Breach wheel strategy does doesn't work out, we're just going to start beating face with giant Termogoyf tokens. So with that being said, let's get into the rest of this deck tech. The first thing I want to cover are the win cons in this deck, because like our commander, they are absolutely disgusting. The first thing we're going to need for our first win con is a way to generate mana whenever we're casting those wheel spells. So stuff like Waste Knot, Bone Miser, and Shirley Bagisaur are going to be amazing. I even included Phyrexian Altar because both Bone Miser and Waste Knot generate tokens whenever we're wheeling, so that's super important. The next part of the strategy, Super simple. All we need is a wheel in our hand or in our graveyard. We need Underworld Breach on the battlefield. And then ideally, we do need a wheel payoff, a way to deal damage whenever we're drawing cards or making our opponents discard cards. The ones I went with are Psychosis Crawler, Blood Chief's Ascension, Orcish Bowmaster, and Shieldred the Apocalypse. I usually try to stay away from these cards in casual, especially Shieldred and Orcish Bowmasters. But whenever we're setting up to be Arch Enemy anyway, we're going to need these tools to beat all three of our opponents. Not to mention, both Shieldred Shieldred and Blood Chief's Ascension are able to gain us life whenever we're drawing cards or forcing our opponents to discard cards, so that's going to be amazing for staying alive and staying in this game. That way we just don't get ganged up on and beaten immediately. Now that we have our engine set up, let's talk about how we're winning the game. The cleanest way to do this is with Dark Deal, Bone Miser, Psychosis Crawler, and Underworld Breach. This is going to make it to where we are the only ones drawing cards so our opponents can't draw into any removal. Because Dark Deal, if you have zero cards in hand, you draw zero cards cards off of it, and what's causing us to draw additional cards is our Bone Miser effect. As long as we are discarding a non-land card each time, we're drawing additional cards, and then we have to make sure we're at least discarding two lands to generate four mana to cast Dark Deal again. Now sometimes we'll whiff, but sometimes we'll hit three lands instead of two, so it's kind of non-deterministic, but you do end up winning the game fairly easily with this setup. Reforge the Soul is a little clunkier, but works very similarly. We do need a Waste Knot Bone Miser on the battle field, and then additionally, I do want to see Phyrexian Altar there. Phyrexian Altar is going to give us that red mana we need to cast Reforge the Soul again, because we're just going to be generating black mana off of our Waste Knot and Bone Miser effects. So now Bone Miser and Waste Knot are generating us 
creature tokens that we can sacrifice to Phyrexian Altar, and that's going to net us more mana. Another very clean win line is the new card, Peer Past the Veil. Now, this one makes it to where only we discard our hand and then draw that many cards. So again, with something like a Bone Miser and then a Phyrexian Altar, with one of our card draw payoffs like Psychosis Crawler, we are going to win the game fairly easily. Just something to think about. There's a lot of different scenarios where you can kind of tie these together. Sometimes it's as simple as casting Reforge the Soul with Orcish Bowmaster out and you get 21 damage and that's enough to finish the table. There's a lot of flexibility in these win lines and it's just going to benefit the player that sits down and learns them all. Additionally, I just wanted to note that Shirley Bagisaur can stand in for Phyrexian Altar here to generate some color mana. That way we're able to cast our Peer Past the Veil and Reforge the Soul to close out the game. And if that plan goes to shit, it's very simple. We're just going to throw Disa on the battlefield. We're going to make some giant Termogoyth creatures and we're going to beat them to death. The next thing we need to do in this deck is get rid of those two cards we are giving our opponents. We don't want to be giving them an advantage in this deck and our commander does that. So let's go ahead and get rid of that right away. The first thing I thought about was just including cards in the deck that make our opponent discard one card every single turn. Like Rankle, Master of Pranks, Liliana of the Veil, we have Kroxa, Titan of Death's Hunger, and last but not least, we have Aklazots. With two of these on the battlefield, we can easily make our opponents discard two cards on our turn, getting rid of the advantage that was given to them. We're also going to throw in Cunning Leathermancer. Something to note about all of these discard effects is some of them even work on us, which actually helps out our strategy. The more card types we can get in the graveyard in the early game is just going to help us out. And then additionally, when you're public enemy number one, you really do want to start taking resources from your opponents as soon as possible. Sadistic Hypnotist is also very perfect here. This guy's just going to allow us to sack a creature and boom, our opponents have to discard two cards. And it's not very hard to generate three creature tokens a turn in this deck. To go along with all of these discard strategies, we're also going to be playing some discard payoffs like Geth Grimoire. Now, whenever an opponent discards a card, we're going to draw a card. And notably, if we force all of our opponents to discard a card, we're going to be drawing three cards. So that's going to be amazing for our Aklazot's effects. It's also really crazy with our wheel effects as well. So it's super important that it's a May ability. That way we don't accidentally deck ourselves. Tiny Bones is not only going to provide a ton of card advantage in this deck, but additionally, he can kind of be a win con. Whenever we're doing the Waste Knot thing and making everybody discard their entire hands with a Dark Deal, eventually they're not going to have a hand. So after we generate a ton of black mana off of Waste Knot and Dark Deal, after our opponents run out of every single card in their hand, we can just shove all that black mana into Tiny Bones and win the game. Last but not least, we can't play an Arch Enemy Wheel deck without Dothy Voidwalker. This guy's absolutely insane. Here. We make them discard their entire hand and then they don't have access to their graveyard and then we're going to have access to every single card in their hand. Not to mention, if you don't know, the Dothy Void Zone never goes away. So we're actually able to sacrifice this guy, get value, and then reanimate him to get even more value out of the cards that he's already exiled. Before we get into all of those cool cards with the dual typings that we're going to be throwing into the graveyard, I want to talk about how we're going to be staying alive in this deck, right? Because that's very important. The discard effects are going to help a little bit because eventually our opponents are going to run out of resources and if they don't have a way to remove any of our stuff because they don't have a hand, we're able to run away with the game. The other thing that's going to help us is a little bit of a life gain strategy. Sangromancer, Shieldred the Apocalypse, and Blood Chief's Ascension all do this while we are willing people and that's going to cause us to gain a ton of life and after a couple of wheels our opponents are not going to be able to touch us. Additionally we are playing a little bit of a goad strategy with shiny impetus. This is going to get rid of any of those Voltron strategies that want to kill us first. Zerzoth Chaos Rider was kind of built for this deck because what's going to happen is your opponents are going to draw two cards on your turn because of your commander and then that's going to trigger him three times then you get three devils and then those devils force our opponents to draw more cards and discard more cards setting off all of our discards synergies. He's actually sneaky good in this deck. And then we're playing Cardor Doom Scourge. And we have Springleaf Nantuko in this deck. So whenever you pair in Cardor with Springleaf Nantuko, as long as you're able to drop one land every single turn, you can keep your opponents in a permanent state of goad and no one is touching you with those creatures. 
Not to mention, we are playing Cursed Mirror and Goblin Engineer in this deck. So as long as you keep looping Cursed Mirror with Goblin Engineer and one other artifact, you're kind of able to goad every other turn, and this is also very impactful, along with the obvious you just sacrifice Kodor and reanimate him with something like a Chainer that we are also playing in this deck. Six and Life from the Loam are also no-brainers here, right? We're able to reanimate our stuff, and then Life from the Loam keeps giving us lands to put into our hand, that way we can just discard them for six. It's very good in this deck, sets off our discard synergies. It's going to allow us to have an access to our graveyard, basically making our graveyard our hand. And then additionally, with that dredge ability, we're putting more cards in the graveyard. All right, let's talk about those dual typing cards that are going to get our delirium count up fast. Shigeki Jukai Visionary, he's perfect, he's ramp, he's mill, fills the graveyard, and he has that channel ability that can not only put him in the graveyard, but get key pieces back from the graveyard. Reinforced Ronin, not as flexible as Shigeki, but you just discard him and boom, you've got an artifact and creature in the graveyard and he replaces himself. Twitching Doll, not only is it a 2CMC mana rock, but additionally, you can sacrifice it instantly putting it in the graveyard. Again, we're hitting that creature and that artifact requirement for the Delirium. Springleaf Nantuko, you really don't want this to get removed, but it's a removable piece. If they don't remove Springleaf Nantuko, whatever you enchanted it with is going to be a problem for your opponents. So it kind of finds itself into the graveyard by itself, if that makes sense. Bitter Reunion, not dual typing, but very easy to sacrifice get it in the graveyard, and it is a little bit of card advantage. Gold Hound, same thing. It's basically a treasure token. You sacrifice it, boom, artifact and creature in the grave. Twin Shot Sniper gets rid of those mana dorks in the early game, and it does have a dual typing. Trickster's Elk, also very cool here, also has a way of finding itself in the graveyard, right? We're going to put this on someone's commander, their deck is going to get bricked, and then they're going to have to find a way to kill their own commander, putting Trickster Elk in the graveyard while killing their commander. Perfect for the deck. Haywire Might kind of does the same thing. We sacrifice Haywire Might, we get to get rid of some of our opponent's stuff, and then we get an artifact and creature in the graveyard. Rune Grinder, very synergistic with the deck. Notably, they're probably not going to take those seven cards whenever you have any of your wheel payoffs out, but sometimes you have wheel payoffs that only benefit off of you drawing cards, so it doesn't matter if they take it or not, and then it does have mountain cycling. So we just throw this guy in the graveyard in the early game and we get a mountain. Very flexible. We'll end it with a few miscellaneous cards that I think are really good in this deck. We have Exploration. Just playing additional lands whenever you're drawing a ton of cards is very good, and we draw a ton of cards in this deck. Invasion of Ikoria also has a way of finding itself in our graveyard because the front side is very good, and they really don't want us to flip that backside because we're going to get a massive dinosaur that's going to make the majority of our creatures unblockable if they let us flip this. Additionally, Jessica Thrice Reborn, kind of amazing in this deck. You can cast her. It's a mini board wipe, gets rid of some key pieces, and then she instantly puts herself in the graveyard, again, helping our delirium out. Fauna Shaman is very good here. Not only can she tutor for the key pieces we need at any given point, additionally, she's going to discard cards to our graveyard. That's going to allow us to get our Delirium count up very fast. We're also going to be running some MDFCs to round out the deck. This is going to be perfect. They're flexible. They can be lands, or we can discard them in the early game, get those instant or sorcery typings in our graveyard to start that Delirium count early. That's going to do it for the video, guys. Thank you guys for watching. Shout out to my patrons, Irrelevant. Chicken Salad, Praetor, and Accessum, you guys rock. I hope this helped you in your deck building endeavors, and I will see you guys in the next one.